Well, before we go forward, as I alluded to earlier, can I interest you in a pop quiz? <laughs> it won't affect your lifetime GPA. <laughs> there aren't any negative ramifications for a low grade. And besides the satisfaction of a good grade, there is no reward for doing well. It's related to scripture. You're going to see it's very brief and you can self-grade. So assuming a kind of unanimous yes from everybody here, I'll proceed to give you those brief instructions for this quiz. The instructions are simply this. I'm going to read three verses of scripture to you. And then what you would do, whether you do it in your mind or you use your bulletin, you could do it in either way. You could jot down an answer mentally or on the piece of paper as to where, what book of the Bible, these scripture verses come from. Three references coming. The first one, when the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. When the waves of death surrounded me, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. Scripture reference number one. Scripture reference number two. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. I'll say that again. Scripture reference number two. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Coals were kindled by it. And then scripture reference number three. He sent from above... He took me. He drew me out of many waters. To read it one more time, he sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. Okay, so do you have your answers? Assuming you do, and even if you don't, let's go ahead and grade the quiz. Now when you hear those references, right, when you hear the first one and you see the language there, the reference to waves and floods, you might think, oh, you know, I'm not sure, but that might come from the book of Jonah, because I know waves and floods were involved in Jonah's story. When you hear in the second reference the imagery of, of fire proceeding, smoke from nostrils, fire proceeding from the mouth, maybe you're thinking, okay, I know what that sounds like to me. That sounds like the Leviathan of Job 41. So I'm thinking that might be coming from Job 41. And then when you hear the final reference, the final reference with the language of being drawn out of waters, he sent from above, he took me, maybe you're thinking of some account that you can't remember from the Gospels. But you're like, maybe Peter at some point, I just don't remember it, recalled Jesus taking his hand as he was sinking in the water, and maybe that's some account that I can't remember. Now you can see the rationale behind all of those guesses, but each one of those guesses would be wrong. Each one of those verses comes from 2 Samuel 22 which is a parallel, not exactly the same, but basically a parallel rendering of Psalm 18. Now that example comes from the book, Cracking Old Testament Codes, and it would be very pertinent if we were studying through 2 Samuel right now. You might remember, some time back, we left off in 2 Samuel 21. If we were studying through 2 Samuel, we'd be on, do the math, 2 Samuel 22. And the reason why that would be important is because in 2 Samuel, we would then have noticed a shift from prose, historic prose, all of a sudden to poetry. But in the book of Psalms, we know we're, we're reading poetry through and through. And so that language that's used in 2 Samuel 22, that language that's also used in Psalm 18, remember they are very similar. I'll point out some differences, but they are remarkably similar. It's poetic imagery. See, David was not in danger of drowning in an ocean. It wasn't like literal floods were going to you know, get him below the water and he was going to suffocate. David was not going to be rescued by a fire-breathing dragon. This is poetic imagery that's meant to communicate, to some degree, David's plight, David's deliverance, and David's deliverer. We'll see that as we get into our study of Psalm 18. As I've already noted and alluded to, Psalm 18 and 2 Samuel 22 are remarkably similar, though they're not exactly the same. Psalm 18, as it's often been noted, was prepared for corporate worship. We'll see that as we get into the superscript in a moment. 
2 Samuel 22, which appears to be an earlier rendering of this psalm, is more autobiographical, if you will. Probably comes at an earlier point in David's life, and then at some point later on, he uses, psalm, uses that psalm from 2 Samuel 22 and prepares it to be sung corporately among the people of God. But it makes you think. If this psalm basically showed up in two places in the Word of God, in the book of 2 Samuel and in Psalm 18, it is worth us making sure that we're taking our time to understand it. I think part of the reason why that is, it's as though this psalm could well summarize David's life of deliverance. If David were to appropriate words from that hymn, Blessed Assurance, I could imagine him taking the line that says, this is my story, this is my song. And in a lot of ways, Psalm 18 and 2 Samuel 22 is that. It's like his story, his song. And at the center of the autobiographical poem, is the God who delivered him so often. There's a quick pastoral parenthetical note at the center of our metaphoric autobiographical poem, if you will, should always be the God who is our deliverer. Now, before we get into the psalm itself, I want us to look at the superscript. The superscript reads like this, to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, or Yahweh, who spoke to Yahweh the words of this song on the day that Yahweh delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul, and he said. So this psalm has quite the superscript. Some might call it a super-duper script. It's very long for a superscript. And I want us to see at least four things that we can learn from it. Four observations. So first thing I want you to notice in the superscript, number one, observe the familiar. Right? What's the familiar? The familiar is to the chief musician. Again, this was prepared for corporate worship. It was to be sung. It was a song that was to be played. It was given to the chief musician. And who is the human author? The human author was David, writing as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit, speaking these words, eventually writing these words as he was carried along by the Holy Spirit. Number one, observe the familiar. Number two, I want you to observe the identification of David in this psalm, at least in the superscript. He's identified as a servant of the Lord or a servant of Yahweh. Now, that is not a, you know, throwaway kind of identification. That's a big deal. Moses is repeatedly identified as a servant of Yahweh. You see that in Deuteronomy. You see it a whole bunch of times in the book of Joshua. You see it repeatedly. I just counted 16 times. Maybe that's the exact number. Maybe there's more. But Moses was identified repeatedly as a servant of Yahweh. Joshua was identified as a servant of Yahweh as well. It's not a throwaway identification. To be identified as a servant of Yahweh is a title that's more noble than to be emperor of this or the king of that. To be identified as a servant of Yahweh is to share an identification that's even used with respect to the Messiah himself. In Isaiah 42, the Messiah is identified as the servant of Yahweh. And to think that all of God's people are called to share that identification. In Psalm 113, verse 1, all the servants of Yahweh, ultimately applying to all the people of God, ultimately, are to praise him. Think of the noble title you bear. You're not a pharaoh. You're not a queen. You're not a king. But you're a servant of Yahweh. And it's a title more noble than you and I can even do well to properly understand in the here and now. Three, I want you to observe when David spoke these words. David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Now, when you go through the entirety of this psalm, and when you look at the superscript, the idea is, or the consensus appears to be, that David wrote this song at a time when the deliverances that he experienced kind of reached their apex. Nations that were against him were sub subjugated to him, and there was military victories, and then there was also the defeat of Saul and his enemies. So the consensus appears to be that this was written at some time in David's reign, probably at a time, and maybe it's like 2 Samuel 8, maybe, as, maybe in 2 Samuel 12 after the subjugation of the people of Ammon, some time of great deliverance when he had been delivered from all of his enemies, military victory after military victory, and also from the hand of Saul and the enemies that assailed him during 
pretty much a large portion of 1 Samuel. Fourth thing I want you to observe is the foundation for the praise that is forthcoming. The foundation for the praise that is forthcoming. Again, still in the superscript. You're going to see that phrase from the hand twice in the superscript. From the hand. David was delivered from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Interestingly, without going into extended detail, two different words are used for hand. The first word that's used for hand is a word that speaks to a kind of grip. It's kind of an open-handed palm, as Alec Moitier notes, that suggests a forthcoming grip. And the second word that's used for hand is just the word that's used for hand, the basic Hebrew word for hand. I think uh, Dr. Barrick is right when he says that both are symbolic of power and control. So David was delivered, if you will, from the clutches, from the grasp, from the grips, from the hands of all of his enemies by the grace of God. Now with that, let's jump into the text. We begin in Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3, where we read, I will love you, O Lord, or O Yahweh, my strength. The Lord, or Yahweh, is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord, or Yahweh, who is worthy to be praised, so I shall be saved from my enemies. So these opening verses, verses 1 through 3, serve as a kind of prelude to the rest of the psalm. And you can see what David is doing here. He is repeatedly piling up one after another identifications for who Yahweh was to him. And that's what he's doing right here. And for those of you who'd want to keep track by way of comparing Psalm 18 to 2 Samuel 22, verse 1 is not found in 2 Samuel 22. But any Israelite or New Testament Christian that has been captivated by the grace of God is thankful that those words in verse 1 show up right here because they provide a vehicle for the expression of affection. I will love you, O Yahweh. And David used an interesting word for love here. It's the Hebrew word rakam. In modern Hebrew, you say it rakam. It's a word that if you go through every usage of the word up until this point, it's used with reference of God's love to man. That's the way the word is typically used. It's the compassionate, tender, merciful love of God towards man. But David is using it here to express his love. So why is David using this word here? The idea appears to be that he's expressing in a very intimate kind of way the tenderness of his affection for his God for his compassionate and merciful God. I will love you, O Yahweh. These are words that spring forth from the soil of deliverance. Even the less affectionate among us can burst forth with words of tender affection in light of a deliverance wrought. My childhood best friend, he wasn't much for brotherly love. (laughs) If he had warm and fuzzy feelings, you didn't know it. But there was this one time when we were at a park, PS52 to be exact, and we were in the midst of a two-on-two game. We had quite a history of playing two-on-twos together. We hadn't played one in a while, but we were playing a two-on-two basketball game together, and we were in a close game. It might have been, I don't remember exactly, to the point where the next basket would win. So we're playing, we get the ball back, and he sets a pick for me at the top of the key. If you don't know what that means, don't really worry about it. Right, so he sets a pick for me at the top of the key. I dribble around. I use that pick as a kind of shield. I jump. I take the shot. I make it. We win the game. And in what was essentially a previously unseen burst of affection, he hugs me. And he says, I love you, man. I remember thinking, I can't believe this. I was just kind of wired to be more affectionate, and I would tell him, like, oh, I'm so thankful for him as a best friend and all of that. But in that moment, he expressed to me great tender affection in light, if you will, of a deliverance wrought. Now, David was delivered from much more than an unsavory basketball defeat. (laughs) Much more. 
I mean, you read through 1 Samuel and just remind yourself, not just from like a reader's perspective, but try to put like your feet in David's sandals and think about what he was delivered from. His whole life was essentially shattered by Saul, that he was relentlessly, year after year after year, hunted by Saul. He was repeatedly but a step away from death, to use language that he uses when he speaks to Jonathan, Saul's son. There's but a step between me and death. And if it wasn't Saul that he had to contend with, it was Amalekites. And if it wasn't Amalekites that he had to contend with, it was Philistines that he had to contend with. Think about what he was delivered from. If you start to imagine that, you can say, I can see why he's saying, I will love you, O Lord. And we're not even talking about the enemies that are seen in 2 Samuel. I just mentioned some from 1 Samuel. And again, even those among us who are, you know, not the most overtly expressive when you think about deliverance wrought, it should begin to burst forth with expressions of affection and gratitude. David was delivered from much more than an unsavory basketball defeat. Now, most Christians cannot compare war stories with David, right? But we can share similar sentiments of gratitude and celebration for a deliverance wrought. I know I've mentioned it a couple times, David wasn't delivered from an unsavory basketball defeat. He was delivered from temporal enemies, but Christians have been delivered from a lot more than temporal enemies. Christians have been delivered from the wrath of God, by God, through his son. So, if you haven't told him lately, use Psalm 18, verse 1, to tell the God that has delivered you from his wrath and from the wrath to come, that you love him. I think one of the highest hopes, among others, for a minister of the gospel is that as a result of the word of God being preached, that the people of God, when they hear the word of God, would tell God, I love you. That they would say to their Savior, I love you. And by your grace, I will love you, O Yahweh. Now comes the blessed assortment of identifications. I can't hear David's tone as he spoke these words, but you kind of can't help but feel it. They reverberate. They drip forth with praise and thankfulness. It's as though David was saying, look, one identification is not enough. At least at this point in time, as I'm writing this psalm, carried along by the Holy Spirit, one identification is not enough. So here comes a blessed onslaught of ascriptions to Yahweh for who Yahweh was to him. The first identification comes at the end of verse 1. My strength. My strength. Fitting that this identification would come as early as it does in this psalm, seeing as it kind of forms a kind of keynote to the rest of the psalm. So right out of the gate, David is essentially making it clear that all of his deliverances and all of his victories were not a result of his own strength, but a result of Yahweh, his strength. They all came from the Lord. And isn't that the truth? If you've gotten a diploma or a trophy, if you have food in the fridge or a roof over your head, what do you have that you have not received? You don't have it by your own strength. You have it because Yahweh is gracious and he's been your strength. Speaking to the people of God. In the first line of verse 2, David continued writing, The Lord, or Yahweh, is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Now, this word that's used here for rock, interesting word, could be rendered as cliff, could be rendered as crag, could be speaking just generally about how a kind of high point, a kind of cliff, how God was like a high point to him, a kind of cliff where he was out of reach of his enemy's grasp. Could be speaking of a crag, a kind of a hiding place within the mountain, as it were. Now, what I find very interesting is that the same word for rock is used in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 25. It's descriptive of the place where David went to when Saul and company went down to find him, and David went down into the wilderness of Ma'an as a result of Saul and company coming to get him. Now, what's very interesting, if you look at that passage in 1 Samuel 23, David is basically a sitting duck at that point. He goes into the wilderness of Ma'an, into the rock there. 
Goes into some rocky area around there. But he's surrounded. Saul's coming on one side with his forces. Saul's forces are coming on the other side. And David is a sitting duck when all of a sudden, David's a sitting duck. He's in big trouble. All of a sudden, a messenger comes to Saul and very hurriedly tells Saul to hurry and come for the Philistines have invaded the land. Saul had to put off hunting David that day when he had him just almost in his grasp. Yet Yahweh delivered him from the grip and the grasp of Saul. Interestingly, that place came to be known as the Rock of Escape. 1 Samuel 23, verse 28. Hold on to that thought. Kind of tie that together with the next ascription in a moment. Along those same lines, the word fortress, when he calls God my fortress, speaks of strongholds in the wilderness that David was so familiar with. It could speak, for instance, of the cave of Adullam, in 1 Samuel 22, verse 4, or the strongholds of Engedi, 1 Samuel 23, verse 29. But I think, like the rock, and like the rock of escape, the fortress used here is essentially emblematic of the God who was really his stronghold. Think about that, that even as David is going through these historical accounts, that even the places where he hid, the mountain crag, or the castle, mountain, fortress, stronghold, as it were. They were essentially just emblematic of the God who was really his rock and his fortress. You know, a mountain castle is a really poor hope of escape without God. But with God, it's an impenetrable fortress. I think Derek Kidner is right in saying, quote, in this rush of metaphors, David relives his escapes and victories. I think that's right, especially seeing how the language is used in places like 1 Samuel. Then David used the description, my deliverer. In other words, God was his rescuer. God was the one who caused or brought about his escapes. God to David was, as the pulpit commentary notes, a living protector, not a mere inanimate defense. Now those descriptions aren't enough. So David continues, and he says, My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. When David says, My God, the word for God here is a Hebrew word, El. We might say in easy transliterated in English, El. That's a word that, as Alec Moitier refers to it as God in his transcendent deity. Then you have the word strength. The word strength is another word in Hebrew that could be rendered as rock which is a familiar designation for God. It speaks to the unchangeable and reliable nature and the sure and strong character of God. David said God was his strength, or more literally in the Hebrew, his rock. David would disagree with Bob Sager, who wrote those lyrics that appeared in the Chevy commercials of back in the day. Remember those Chevy commercials with the lyrics, like a rock, I was strong as I could be, like a rock, nothing ever got to me. David wouldn't sing that. <laughs> you won't find that in Psalm 18, and you won't find that in another psalm. David knew who his rock was. And things did get to David. Things did get to him. You're going to see a little bit later on in the psalm, he says that he was afraid, and as I'll note to you in the Hebrew, that word basically means terrorized. So David wasn't saying, I was like a rock, as strong as I could be. No, no, no. God was my rock. He was as strong as he could be. That's the only reason why I was preserved. No, things got to David. But God, by his grace, brought David through. And it's fitting that David would then say, in whom I will trust. Now, you might remember this because we've seen this repeatedly in the Psalms. When you see that word trust, remember in the Hebrew, the idea is taking refuge in. It provides a really brilliant word picture for us of what it looks like to take refuge in God, what it looks like to trust God. It looks like taking refuge in him. It looks like finding asylum or shelter in the fortress who is God, running to him. It is essentially what a person is doing when he or she looks to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. When somebody believes the testimony that God has given concerning his son, to use language from 1 John 5.11, the testimony that God has given for his son, it's essentially somebody saying, I'm running to Christ for shelter. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. To trust Christ looks like running to him, believing the testimony of God, trusting the word of God, and running to Jesus for shelter, 
from the wrath that we deserve for our sins. And then there's the remaining ascriptions found in the rest of verse 2. My shield, that connotes defense. The horn of my salvation. Horn is metaphoric imagery like the horns of an ox. That connotes strength. You might even say offense. So shield, defense. The horn of my salvation, the strength of my salvation, offense. And that God was also his stronghold, a proverbial high tower at a secure height, an unassailable fortress. Now, there's one thing I want to note before moving on. I want you to note, because it's rather obvious in the text, but it bears saying that who Yahweh was to David was not merely academic. It wasn't merely intellectual. It wasn't theoretical. It was extremely personal. You see that through all the personal pronouns that are found in our text. Repeatedly, David is saying what Yahweh was to him. My, my strength, my deliverer, my God, my shield, my stronghold, and so on. Personal. Now, I do think we can apply this to ourselves, that it behooves us in like manner to not only know Jesus as the Savior, but to know him as, to use language from 2 Timothy 1.10, our Savior. Not only to know Jesus as the Lord, but to use language from John, from the Gospel of John, specifically Thomas, to know him as my Lord. Or even as Paul in Philippians 3.8 called him my Lord. Every Christian should be able to personalize the Gospel, to be able to say like what Paul said in Galatians 2.20, that Jesus loved me and gave himself for me. So it's good if you could say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Lord. I I believe that he's that. But do you believe that he is your Savior? Can you say, he is my Savior, my Lord, my Redeemer? You don't want your relationship with the living God to just be simply intellectual, which in its worst case scenario would suggest the reality of no relationship. You want it to be like it was as communicated here, personal. And by the grace of God, intensely personal. So in light of who God was, David could then rightly and wisely say, you look at verse 3, I will call upon the Lord, or Yahweh, who is worthy to be praised, so I shall be saved from my enemies. Now in the Hebrew text, the very first word that's found here is mehulal. Mehulal begins the verse, and it basically means to be praised, or worthy to be praised. As Dr. Barak notes, by its position, it is emphatic and exclamatory. So you even get David's, uh, the reverberation of David's praise coming forth in that. Mehulal, he just begins, he's worthy of praise. The text communicates the principle that was at work in David's life. It was essentially something like this. You look at the beginning and the end of verse 3. So long as I call upon the Lord, I shall be saved from my enemies. That was how it worked out in David's life. He called, and God answered. He called, and God answered. Which tells you what about God? It tells you that God is a prayer-answering God. I called, and He answered. I think it's worth us noting, too, that even as the paradigm for David was, so long as I call, so I am saved from my enemies, the people of God were to see that paradigm as their own. Remember, this was meant for the people of God to sing. The people of God were to say, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so I shall be saved from my enemies. And I think it's worth us noting as New Testament Christians that we can apply this, of course, with nuance, by taking some New Testament texts, like in Matthew 7. So long as I ask, I shall receive. So long as I seek, I shall find. I might not always receive what I have asked for, I might not always find what I was initially seeking, but I know that everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door shall be opened. It just might not be in the way that I thought. And know at the end of the day, because if you look at this text and you say, wait, how can I say this as a Christian? I know Christians are being martyred all over the world. So how can a Christian say Psalm 18 verse 3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so I shall be saved from my enemies? How can a Christian say that, especially Christians who are dying in parts of this world for the gospel? And again, I think we need to be reminded what ultimate preservation looks like biblically. As I've noted many times before, 
It's in 2 Timothy chapter 4 where the Apostle Paul noted that he was being poured out as a drink offering. That basically he had reached the end of his race and he was about to give his life for the gospel. And yet at the same time in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I believe it's verse 18, he said that the Lord would deliver him from every evil work and preserve him safely into his heavenly kingdom. So I would argue, yes, a Christian can sing Psalm 18, verse 3. But it just might not work out the way that you're thinking. But ultimately, God preserves His people from every evil work. What does that mean? How does He preserve them if they're dying? By them holding on to the gospel even till the very end. And not being moved away from the gospel. Not becoming apostate at the very end. And being preserved safely into the eternal life that was procured for them by Jesus Christ. That's clearly the biblical idea Old Testament-wise, New Testament-wise, ultimately, especially when you look at 2 Timothy 4, because Paul's using that very kind of language there. But I do want us to note, just, just by application to us, how will we come to know God as the God who answers the calls of His people if we don't call upon Him? Well, I think the first way you answer that is say, I know it through the Word of God. And that's the clear answer. That's the basis of your understanding. But you can know it experientially. And I think sometimes Christians just don't realize not only what peace they often forfeit, but what wisdom we often forfeit, what answers to prayer we often forfeit, what guidance we often forfeit, what provision we often forfeit, because we don't bring everything to God in prayer. Just think of what your story would be like by the grace of God if you prayed all the more, if you called out, then maybe there'd be a greater litany of answers if there's more calling out. We know how this works in the world. In the natural world, you think of a farmer that goes out to sow seed. And if a farmer goes out and he sows 10 seeds in a big field, he's, he, he's not going to be surprised when he comes and there's not a big harvest. Like, where's all the harvest? I sowed 10 seeds. But if he's got bags and bags of seeds and he's throwing out all of those seeds, he can expect a greater harvest. And I think sometimes in our prayer lives, we don't realize how little we are sowing into prayer. And then when we reap such a little harvest, we say, why is the harvest so little without realizing we sowed so little? David said, I will call upon the Lord essentially so long as I called, so I shall be saved from my enemies. God has plenty of provision and wisdom and help to give his people. Now we come to a poetic recounting of David's history in verses 4 and 5, particularly the, the dreadful moments he faced. Verse 4 reads, The pangs, or cords, that are rendered as cords, of death surrounded me, and the floods, speaking of waves, of ungodliness, or literally Belial, made me afraid. Again, now verse 5, the sorrows, that word, same word at the beginning of verse 4, cords. The cords of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. So here in verses 4 and 5, we have basically four expressions that David used to communicate how close he was to death's door. And again, as I noted, from 1 Samuel 20, verse 3, he told Jonathan, for instance, there is but a step between me and death. What you have here in Psalm 18, verses 4 and 5, is basically the poetic unpacking of that statement. You look at the language here. The first expression, rendered differently in 2 Samuel 22, verse 5, says, the pangs or the cords of death surrounded me. And then you have the imagery of cords, again, at the beginning of verse 5. The, cord, the sorrows or cords of Sheol surrounded me. So the idea here is like David felt like death had surrounded him. David felt as though he was entangled by death. Picture like ropes. Picture ropes being around his arms, being around his legs. And it's as though death is personified here to have ropes or to be ropes that are essentially pulling him down into the grave. The second line of verse 4, and the floods of godly ungodliness. Interesting word that's used here, Belial, could be rendered as worthlessness. He said, the floods of ungodliness made me afraid. Just some brief unpacking here. The floods connote imagery of waves breaking upon David one after another. That word for ungodliness could be rendered here, like I said, as Belial. As one commentator notes, it evokes images of the netherworld as described in Canaanite mythology. 
So as I'll note, Lord willing, next week, there may be a polemic dynamic at work in this section where David is basically using language that would have been familiar to paganism around him to say it's as though the forces behind paganism were close to triumphing, but at the end of the day, they ultimately proved futile to withstand the hand of Yahweh. That may be part of what's going on here. But just to note, the word for ungodliness might not necessarily connote that, though there is reason to think it might, can connote simply worthlessness and wickedness. And David no doubt had to deal with that. I do want you to note here that David, see, you might just think of David in his 1 Samuel 17 account when he's standing before Goliath and you just see such courage. You know, the men of Israel are kind of quaking in their boots, boots and David's basically like, what's going on here? Is there not a cause? And he walks and he's got such courage when he stands before Goliath. And you just might think of David as always being like that, stoically staring down the cords of Sheol even as they wrap their, themselves around him. But it wasn't always like that. Not at all. He said the floods of ungodliness made him afraid. That's a strong word in the Hebrew. That word could be rendered as terrorized or terrified or troubled. It's used to describe Saul when he was troubled or terrorized by an evil spirit, 1 Samuel 16, 14, and 15. It's used to describe David when he was afraid of the angel of the Lord in 1 Chronicles 21, 30. It's used to describe Haman when he was exposed by Queen Esther to the king and he knew that he was in big trouble. He was terrified. He was terrorized, if you will. So I want you to see that David was not immune to fear, but he knew what to do when he was afraid. We see that very clearly in this psalm, but we see David say what he, say what he used to do in Psalm 56, verse 3. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. But note, per this psalm, trusting, as we'll see in verse 6, involved calling upon the Lord. So I just want to encourage you. You, you know this, but it's good to be reminded. You can't isolate yourself from fear, right? No matter what you do, you just can't cut yourself. Fear will show up in one way or another in your life, but just because it shows up doesn't mean it has to stay. When you are afraid, Psalm 56, verse 3, you trust in God. When you are afraid, you call upon the Lord. Psalm 18, verse 6, as we'll see. David goes on to say here that the snares of death confronted him. It's as though the nets of death were suddenly before him. And in light of the previous lines, he was bound by it. He was on the way to death without divine intervention. And that brings us to verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. And he heard my voice from his temple and my cry came before him even to his ears. Now, you don't have to imagine much of what David's distress looked like. He said, in my distress. Well, like, what does he mean by that? Just look at the previous verses. <clears throat> death was right before him. He was basically in, 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 entangled by death. He was almost in the grip of his enemies. His distress was indeed distressful. And what did David do? What was his general pattern? In my distress, I called upon Yahweh, and I cried out to my God. And David's prayer, as you'll see in the text, reached all the way up there. Up where? The text tells us, he heard my voice from his temple. From his temple. And we know even as the temple would be built in the days of Solomon, that it would be essentially representative, even as the tabernacle was, as of the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle where God's heavenly throne is. So David cries, and just think of the network on which your prayers travel. It's far greater than 5G. <laughs> and you can't jam this frequency. You can't jam the transmission. No one can. You cry out to God, and it gets right where it needs to go. He could discern it the minute you cry it. As a matter of fact, he knows it before you even speak it. But think about the way that this is depicted here. I cried, and my cry went right up. Just imagine, just imagine the prayer kind of making its way through the heavens to reach the heaven of the heavens, and all of a sudden it comes right before the throne of God. And the God of the universe who knows all things hears very personally and very intimately the cry of his servant David. 
How amazing. What an inspiration for prayer. The message would get there. Undoubtedly, when you cry out to God, coming through the blood of the Son, in the name of Jesus, nothing can stop your words from reaching your God. Just as God heard the cries of the children of Israel, their cries reached his ears, Exodus 3.9. And even as David's cries reached to Yahweh's throne, so God hears the cries of New Testament saints. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, the first half of it says that the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. You speak, and that prayer travels on a network that cannot be interrupted. He hears your words before you speak them. He hears the thoughts of your mind, but you want to be like David here in your distress, calling upon and crying out to the Lord your God. The blood-bought Christian can say like Jesus, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Think of what an honor that is, using language from John chapter 11, verse 41. Now, I want, we're going to stop there. But I want you to know that what follows in the verses that follows is, in my opinion, one of the greatest encouragements for prayer that I could think of in the scriptures. You think about the voice and the prayer of David reaching to the throne of God. And when we get into what we will, Lord willing, next week, I think it's a tremendous encouragement for prayer. Wait till you see what happens as a result and as a response. But in the meantime, so as to encourage you, on the way to that exposition, Lord willing, next week. I think John Flavel put it well, and parts of his writing is recounted in Spurgeon's Treasury of David when he said, the prayer of a single saint is sometimes followed with wonderful effects. What then can a thundering legion of such praying souls do? A little bit later on he would go to write, the Queen of Scots professed she was more afraid of the prayers of Mr. Knox than of an army of 10,000 men. Christian, I said to you earlier in the message that one of the great hopes for any minister of the gospel is that as a result of the word preached, that the people of God would say to their God and to their Lord, I love you. To use the language of Psalm 18 to say, I love you. And doubtless, one of the greatest encouragements that you can have as a minister of the gospel is to see the people of God growing in the intimacy of their relationship with their God, calling him my rock, my fortress, my savior, my deliverer. But please know, one of the greatest encouragements is when the people of God press in and pray to the God of heaven more and more. Cry out to God. Cry out to God. If the enemies of the gospel were thinking in one sense wrongly, yet in another sense rightly, they would fear the prayers of the saints more than just about anything else. Right? If those who have agendas that are anti-Christ in one way or another were thinking wrongly in one sense, yet rightly in another sense, they would say, the one thing I don't want to happen is for the people of God to cry out to God. So I tell you all the more, cry out to God. Cry out to God. Pray. And I want to close here with making a gospel call. So we'll get into more encouragement for prayer. Some of the most tremendous Tremendous encouragement coming in the verses that follow. And think about, if you're going to see amazing doctrine of God that I think is communicated in the verses that follow. I'm so excited about that. But I don't want to end without giving a gospel call that I think is very, um, very easy to feel in light of verse 6. David said, in my distress, I called upon Yahweh and I cried out to my God and he heard my voice from his temple. You know, when you go through the scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, when people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, oftentimes there's some measure of distress that you see before that moment. For example, when Peter is preaching in Acts chapter 2, that Pentecost sermon, and when he applies the guilt of that generation to his hearers who had crucified the Lord of glory, they were, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 7, cut in their heart. They were distressed, if you will. You might remember in Acts chapter 16, when all of a sudden there was this earthquake and the prisoners, the, the, the prisoners are set free. There's that Philippian jailer who is distressed in that moment. 
And you think about what those people said to Peter in Acts chapter 2 or what the Philippian jailer said to Paul and Silas in Acts 16. It was something like this. Acts chapter 2, brethren, what must we do? Or the Philippian jailer, sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, when the gospel is preached and you know that you are guilty before a holy God, all of a sudden your heart is cut. Now, if your conscience is seared, you won't feel it. There's no distress. You say, I'm fine, I'm in a good place, I am holy, I am righteous, I am safe and secure, I am fine. But if the Holy Spirit is working in your heart, there's a sense in which you are distressed, you're cut to the heart, you know something's wrong. You know that you're guilty before a holy God. You fear the wrath to come. You could say like David, although the context is different, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. And that's what Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer to do. Sirs, what shall I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. What about those who said to Peter, brethren, what what must we do? Repent. Repent. Have a change of thinking that results in a change of behavior. And then demonstrate your saving faith by being baptized. So I would encourage you, I would encourage you in hearing the preaching of God's word, in knowing about the ultimate deliverance that is wrought through the Son because we need deliverance from the wrath to come, I would encourage you, and I hope by the grace of God, if you haven't come to the gospel, that in this moment you're feeling some measure of distress, but that distress can be relieved through the grace of faith. Believe the gospel. What must I do to be saved? Call upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10, 13, quoting Joel chapter 2. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Want to talk about a message that runs on a network that cannot be interrupted? Every time a sinner repents and says, I believe the gospel in my distress because I know my guilt, I call upon the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive me, and I trust in him for the forgiveness of sins. That message always reaches right to God's temple, if you will, right to his throne. And then the pardon is received by grace through faith. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Plenty more to go. Awesome psalm. And Lord willing, we'll continue our study, Lord willing, next week. Let's pray. Father, oh, we thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the ways in which through your word, your hands are continuously stretched forth out To us sinners, Lord, who in and of ourselves are just obstinate and disobedient, yet you and your great grace afford us opportunity after opportunity to call upon you. And we we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit that comes as a result of your grace, Lord. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that if there be anyone in this place who hasn't come to that place, that perhaps in a distress of heart, you would find them calling upon the name of the Lord and then by your grace being saved from the wrath to come. Father, for those who have come to that place, I pray that there would be a sense in which you would hear um, more from us even this day and by your grace increasingly in the days ahead, us telling you that we love you. May you help us, Heavenly Father, that that we would draw near to you, seeing how you have drawn so near to us, so much so that you've given us your Holy Spirit, whom you've poured out abundantly upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Hallelujah. Thank you for your word. May you continue to nourish us through it, renew our minds through it, and may much fruit be born from it, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.